Yeah. Hello and welcome to this workshop on the future of open source architectures. This is one of the five simultaneous workshops being conducted at the Global Technology Summit 2020 under Carnegie India's Knowledge Transfer Initiative. Our Knowledge Transfer Initiative aims to bridge a bridge between those who are at the forefront of knowledge advancements, like the speakers today, and the stakeholders who are interested in learning about these advancements. So without much further ado, I, I will introduce the facilitator for this workshop, Michael Nelson. Mike Nelson is a co colleague at Carnegie Endowment. Uh, he's the director of Carnegie Endowment's Technology and International Affairs Program. Mike also teaches at the Georgetown University. Uh, Mike has previously worked in the private sector at Cloudflare, Microsoft, Bloomberg, and IBM. Uh, he has also worked in government for the US Senate Subcommittee on Science, Technology, and Space, and at the White House. Uh, he has served as the chairman of the Information, Communication, and Computing section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He serves as a trustee of the Institute for Com International Communications and was selected to be a global leader for tomorrow uh, by the uh, World Economic Forum. Today, he's joined by three distinguished speakers. Uh, first, uh, Deborah Bryant is uh, Senior Director for Open Source Program Office at the Red Hat uh, Corporation, where she leads the company's com community strategy and a global team responsible for its stewardship in open source software communities. She has previously served Oregon's executive branch as deputy state CIO. She founded and directed the government open source conference. She serves on numerous nonprofit boards, and she has recently appointed for the she was recently appointed for the first time, third time as board member for the open source uh, initiative. Uh, Alistair Kroll uh, is the co-founder of CoRadiant, uh, the one-year labs accelerator, and a variety of other startups. He has also launched and chaired some of the world's leading conferences on emerging technology, including Startup Fest, Strata, Cloud Connect, FWD50, BitNorth, and others. Alistair is the author of four books on technology and entrepreneurship, including the best-selling Lean Analytics, which has been translated into eight languages, I'm told, and is now in its 10th print in China. Uh, the, third, the fourth speaker is David Eaves. Uh, uh, David is a lecturer at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He's been an advisor to the office of the mayor of Vancouver. He's advised various governments on technology and policy issues. He was a member of the Ontario's uh, open uh, government engagement team in 2014-15. David has also served on the, as the first director of education for Code for America. David has also worked with 18F and the Presidential Innovation Fellows at the White House. Uh, David also advises nonprofits and advocacy groups on critical negotiations. He developed and helped implement collaborative strategies for open source communities such as Drupal and Mozilla. Uh, all of these speakers have woken up at a very odd hour to do this for us. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Shigish. You've done an incredibly thorough job of introducing us all, I would make one correction. We are not speakers today. We are discussion catalysts. This is a seminar. This is a discussion with all of us. It's not four of us as sages on the stage just telling you what you need to know. This is a conversation back and forth. And so in that way, this is really an example of open collaboration. Uh, you could all sit there and watch us later if this was just a one-way conversation, but we're using Teams. We're going to really try to give chances to people to share their own experiences and their own organizations. <clears throat> we've got a number of special guests that we brought in. Um, I was particularly glad to see that uh, Ritaro Okada from uh, Japan, who's a leader there in the open source movement, has just joined us, but we have a number of people who I think will be able to share share ideas, share comments, and um, we'll be able to bring them into the conversation as well. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm the director of the Technology and International Affairs program at Carnegie. I've been here in Washington for a little over a year, and our job is to look at how technology is changing society around the world, and particularly to focus on the changes in geopolitics made possible by technology. And uh, my team has an incredibly broad portfolio. We're doing everything from figuring out how artificial intelligence will change democracy to how 
banks can protect themselves better from cyber attacks. We've got a very, very impressive network called the Partnership for Countering Influence Operations, which is working to fight disinformation around the world. Uh, my own team is also very involved in internet governance and uh, working with the Internet Governance Forum at the United Nations. Uh, later today, uh, just to give a little commercial, we're having a, a panel discussion with Fabrizio Hashild Drummond, who is the digital advisor to the UN Secretary General's, uh, and, and, and he is the, uh, the, the leading person behind their digital cooperation agenda. And he's being joined by Nivruti Ray, uh, Rai, who is the head of Intel India. So if you care about how governments and the UN in particular are shaping the development of technology and the adoption of technology and the use of technology, uh, you'll want to watch that. But as you obviously know, the Global Technology Summit has a lot of things to offer. Uh, we're very glad that you've joined us for this workshop. What we're going to do today is I'm going to provide just a few minutes of comments, a little bit of history and a little speculation, and then turn it over to Deb Bryant, who will give us a sense of what Red Hat sees for the future and what she in particular has done to work with communities to develop uh, open source software. And more importantly, all of the things that open source uh, facilitates. Alistair will then go and talk more about examples of open communities, open collaboration. And then we'll finish with David, who has done really in-depth studies of how open collaborative communities work and what can be done to make them work better. So again, let me just provide a little context. I, I think, um, I wish I could do a quick poll, but I assume that almost everybody on this call knows what open source is. But you may not know all the ways in which open and open source gets used. We are not going to sit here and give a detailed uh, discussion of how to build your open source uh, uh, platform. We're really going to talk about. Um, we're not going to, you know, talk about coding in particular languages or uh, the like. Uh, and we're certainly not going to throw a lot of diagrams with a lot of um, complicated flowcharts and org, org charts, because we want to, you to understand really the essence of what's going on here. And the essence of what's going on here is that we have a battle going on, and we have for about 30 years, between those people who want to make technology very open and accessible, and those who are trying to build very proprietary systems and lock you in to those systems. Um, and that's that's been going on. The interesting thing is that we have places in our digital economy for both approaches. But over the last 30 years, more and more of the technologies we rely on, and particularly the ones that are built into the infrastructure of our global economy, are open source. And it was funny because 30 years ago, when I was first involved in tech policy, there was this vicious fight going on. At some companies, you had people saying that you know, open source is just a terrible idea. And it's, it's, it's really like the opposite of capitalism. And it's trying to destroy uh, the free market because they felt that really technology and software needed to be locked up and you had to have owners. Whereas the open source community was was going the opposite direction and saying, look, you know, we've got this great technology. Everybody should use it. Everybody should share it. We don't want patents. We don't want copyrights. We want this to be something everyone can use. Um, and the it turned out that, that the reason people supported those open source approaches is because it worked. Um, the Internet itself, the TCP IP protocol is open standard. Everybody's using it. Tim Berners-Lee, more than 35 years ago, decided that he's not going to go in the proprietary direction. So he made the protocols for the web open. At the time, there were lots of proprietary solutions competing with him, just as there were proprietary solutions for PC, TCP IP that were competing with it. And in both cases, because the technology was free and open and people could build on it easily, 
those technologies dominate. Today, we don't hear much about the fight, but we do have different models and different ways of developing technology. And this is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, the other thing we're gonna talk about, in addition to open source software, is open data and what's happening in companies and governments around the world, where not only are they making the software freely available, they're making terabytes of data available. And again, they're finding that when they do that, they don't give up ownership. They don't lose power and control or, uh, or revenue. They actually bring people into the discussion. They build things on their platform, which is built on open source software and open source and, uh, and open data. And that's, that's really what I think all four of us are gonna talk about is, is how do you build a collaborative organization that shares and, 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 and builds on each other's work. Um, this, is, this is not something that happens in a lot of other sectors. So in many ways, the IT industry, particularly the software industry, has been building new models that could be applied in a lot more places, and we'll hear about more about that later. The other thing that um, I wanted to end on, and I challenge each of the other three speakers and anyone in the audience to help come up with ways to explain what it is that we're doing here. And, and, and part of the reason I was so excited to do this session is because there is so much fear, uncertainty, and doubt about our digital future and a lot of confusion about how software is created and how it gets used. And I think we really need to change our ways of thinking about the digital world. In particular, I want to mention a couple of slogans. Uh, when I came to Washington, I learned the power of a good bumper sticker. And a, a, a good bumper sticker can make your program succeed, make your product succeed, or a bad bumper sticker can destroy your opportunity and mislead people and lead to a lot of very bad decisions. And, and right now in the area of openness, particularly open data, we have a lot of bad bumper stickers, slogans that are getting in the way of clear thinking. My best example of that is something that was on the cover of The Economist magazine about three years ago. Data is the new oil. This is absurd. And yet every time you hear someone talk about the future of the economy and artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, people keep coming back to data is the new oil. Well, what's wrong with that idea? Most important thing that's wrong with it is it doesn't realize the power of sharing. It implies that data is something that I have and I can give to you, but then I won't have it. The whole point of data is you can copy it as many times as you want and you can share it and build on it and, and do great new things. And yet businesses and companies are treating it like it's some kind of, of good that you, you can burn, but you can't share. So my, my analogy is instead that trust is the new oil. That's the thing that you really have to find, build, and use. And again, we'll be talking a lot about trust because that's what the open movement is all built on. The better analogy is data is the new air. Data is something that can free flow, flow freely across borders. And more importantly, it's something that can be used and reused and reused. I can breathe it and then you can breathe it. Plants can breathe it. It can get polluted, but it can also get cleaned. And it's essential. That's the most important reason to use this analogy. It is essential to all that we're doing. And so I challenge our, our speakers to come up with some good bumper stickers. And I will close with the words of Vince Cerf, who said, information is power, but information sharing is far more powerful. And that's what we're doing here today. And I will turn it over to Deb, who will now 
share a few slides and get our discussion going. All right. Well, good morning. Let's see if I can muster enough technical expertise to share a slide. Excellent. You got it? Yep. All right. Now let me go find my window and be your guide. <laughs> and we'll start by being in the wrong place. So good morning and thank you for the invitation to participate. Uh, as Michael and our host mentioned, uh, I am from Red Hat. And I have a great privilege of having a day job that's focused on helping build healthy communities. Uh, Red Hat has a 25 hit year history of uh, being uh, part of the open source community. And I'm grateful uh, my colleague David will be talking more about how communities work later in the talk. I'm going to focus a bit more on what we're seeing with open source today, why it's important, and why it affords us a great future. I wanted to start the discussion by talking a bit about the impact that COVID-19 has had on open source and the impact that open source has had on COVID-19. Uh, right now, the tremendous economic pressures that companies are feeling have led them to do things like defunding or reducing uh, work in R&D and focusing more on doing more with often fewer staff that they have. At the same time, we found that companies are uh, accelerating their digital transformation initi initiatives, which have become really critical in an environment where much of the workforce is now working remotely, and the tools we need to be able to operate that way are paramount. I know you all probably have examples in your mind of what those things are, but uh, open source has met the need to both enable transformation, also reduce costs, and uh, increasing the velocity of uh, software development. The second significant force and impact we're seeing is the ability to actually get urgent things done during the global pandemic. The kinds of tools and platforms that have been in place for many years to be able to develop open source software and the really important methodology and the way communities work together, we're just waiting for this kind of an opportunity to be relevant and help the ability to move fast uh, is, is paramount. We've seen numerous areas where open source has had a huge impact. So as an example, Singapore in March open source their contract tasting applications, uh, as has the UK, Canada, US, many other countries are, are uh, following in suit and finding both sharing the development of the application and ways to share that data and increasingly also focusing on how to do that uh, while preserving privacy have become important and open source has done that. We've seen other applications and open architecture, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a company with a 3D printer used an open design principle to share the design for personal protective equipment. Uh, so you could print a 3D uh, 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 a face mask on a 3D printer. 3D printers are driven by open source software, and those design principles have been really quite critical and helpful. And then, of course, tremendous use that that important data word. Uh, there are uh, applications and platforms like Hadoop. Uh, and TensorFlow that have become the crown jewel in the ability of data scientists to be able to work with, uh, with data, which is everything during the pandemic. So a little bit, so the, 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 the two minute vision of what we'll see, the values of open source are going to remain constant. That's openness and accessibility, open standards and operability. Uh, collaboration and transparency, those are hallmarks of the way the model works. And Red Hat uh, has been using this for years, and it's a, a measure of its success as a UK commercially. But we're seeing that increasingly the standard for collaboration in that model is being used in, ver in lots of different domains. I think you'll continue to see increased intersectionality with science, 
with uh, civil society, government, uh, humanitarian efforts. Many examples there. But since this is a workshop, I'll try to give you a couple of insights that may be helpful as you think about where you're at in your own journey and your company's journey, or as a student as you face your future in open source. A couple of trends we've seen in the last five years. One significant one is the rise of software foundations. We're seeing an accelerated growth of those foundations and the number of them and the impact. We're also seeing as part of that more of a focus on vertical markets. So examples of that would be uh, uh, AI and automotive uh, carrier grade Linux, uh, FinTech and open source foundations, and even things like uh, the uh, film industry, uh, Open Academy, uh, have their own software foundation to collaboratively produce software that's specific to their industry. There's more formal governance we're seeing coming into play for large scale projects. And that's primarily because so many of the companies and organizations that are participating actually have no history and background in open source development. A great example of that is the telecom industry, where just a few years ago, you would have never met a telco person who thought they'd be in the software industry. But today we know that G5 networks won't happen without open source. The other large shift we're seeing is the perceived value by industry of open source. In the early days, it was primarily a reduction of costs, flexibility, and freedom from vendor lock-in. We're now seeing innovation by survey as a major attractor. And innovation is not unique to, but it's especially important uh, and a, a value of uh, of the open source development model we're seeing in an unprecedented way today as we bring together different perspectives and great diversity into these communities we're creating better software we're great uh, creating better communities of expertise uh, that uh, are, are doing things that we weren't doing even five years ago this is just a quick look at the rise of software foundations 10 years ago we had about half of what we see today the little red line shows how many of gone away. This is a persistent and important part of the feature. A couple of the things I will throw out for you to think about, especially if you're thinking uh, formally of approaching open source in your institution. One is the creation of open source program offices. Uh, these didn't really exist except for maybe in uh, Google and uh, in a sense Red Hat uh, a few years ago. Now we're seeing every large company of any size starting to create that by survey. Uh, Linux Foundation uh, suggested that over 100 of their member companies either have an open source program office today or are planning or are in the process of building one. And it's very easy in the last year or so to find a publicly available information on how those work, how you can get started, the impact it has on your organization. The last trend is intersourcing. It's not really open source. It's adopting open source methods and tools inside your organization to develop internal software uh, that provides the same benefit internally in terms of changing the culture and creating uh, more robust software with better collaboration. Some companies are using it as a bridge strategy, hoping to participate in open source communities at a future date. It makes the lawyers more comfortable too. So those are my quick introductory comments. I'm really looking forward to the participation portion of the audience. And I guess I'm going to hand this off to uh, my colleague, Alistair. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well done. And I will stop sharing my screen as soon as I find the button. Thanks, gentlemen. Alistair, you're muted. That's better. Uh, hi, Michael. Can you see me, hear me better now? Very good. Do you have my smooth jazz voice? <laughs> uh, so let me give you good morning, everyone. Five o'clock in the morning voice. Thank oh, you. Five o'clock in the morning voice. That's right. I haven't woken up this early since I had to get on an airplane. Um, so good morning, everyone. And Michael, to uh, follow your uh, opening remarks, I'm not going to show any slides, but I will try to give you some bumper stickers or posters on the sides of buses, as I've seen in DC. Uh, COVID spelled backwards is nearly divorce. Uh, I realized this yesterday and I'm not married, but um, if you put it backwards, it's actually nearly divorce. And I'd like to say that the best way to think about open source uh, is how we break up. Uh, open source uh, 
you find out how much of your open source wasn't open and how much of your stack wasn't open when you try to leave a system that exists. Uh, Mike gave us a very optimistic opener, which is that if you look at the tremendous value that has been created by making things open, it's remarkable. Uh, we live today atop a stack of HTTP and TCP and IP. And if you compare that to Prodigy and CompuServe and AOL, which were alternatives at the time, or you compare the networking to Banyan Vines or the intranet to Novell Network, these were all very viable products that in the late 90s we were likely to choose. And we could well have had archipelago of different stacks, but we didn't. But the Grinch in me, since it's close to holiday time for some of us, looks at that value and compares it to the value of taking open source and making it private, which is every instance at Amazon. Uh, it's the stack of things running at Google and elsewhere, every virtualization container. Those things were built on open source, but have been turned private by people who operate them as services. Back in 2010, Chris Anderson wrote an article for Wired Magazine called The Web is Dead. And his point back in 2010 was that the World Wide Web was in decline. A simpler, sleeker services, think apps, are less about searching and more about the getting. And as he put it then, you've spent the day on the internet, but you're not on the web and you are not alone. And this was in 2010, the iPhone was just hitting us. And he was already talking about apps, right? Uh, Corey Doctor, a couple of years later, wrote this amazing screed called The Coming War on General Purpose Computing. And his point was that the apps were scary because you can't inspect the code, you can't copy and paste what you want. You have lots of things deep in um, the design opinions of the person who built the walled garden. The computers that are in our Internet of Things, the computers uh, that are in our apps, the code that's in our apps is often hard to get out. So I think if, if you want some bumper stickers for open source, open source is really about paying it forward. Um, open source is yes, it's a great example um, that people have taken open source code and turned it into products and services. But then if that community pays it forward again and uh, does things like, um, uh, you know, opens up the work they're making and, and builds on the community, that's kind of a saving grace. Um, but focusing on the code of open source to me is a distraction because open source is more of a philosophy and a business model. Uh, if you think about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, well, in the digital world, we have digital life, digital liberty, and digital pursuit of happiness, but open source is digital liberty. It's the right to own our destiny on our terms if we want it. That's a philosophy. That's not a bunch of code that you can read. That's not about right-clicking view source and having it not be inspectable. We have to think of open source as open hardware, open code, open data, open algorithms, open services, and open metadata. And so when I said that COVID spelled backwards divorce, ask yourself, if you leave a CRM, you may be able to download all your data, but if you don't have the same metadata and the same design patterns and the same algorithms, you have a very hard time getting the same level of functionality from something yourself. Now, when I talk about open source, I often mention organizations like OpenStreetMaps, which are kind of an open source replacement for Google Maps data, uh, Common Crawl, which indexes the web so people can build atop it, Open Corporates, which creates huge databases of hundreds of millions of corporations, Wikimedia, obviously, if you're building an open source philosophical application, presumably you're building it on open hardware with open code, using this kind of open data in an open service that you that is documented about pulling away uh, or migrating or running on your own. And to me, that's the interesting stack. Now, I'll end with a couple of get examples in government here, and I'm going to throw Canada under the bus. Uh, the U.S. Uh, and Sean Boots in the Canadian Digital Government uh, sent me a couple of examples of this earlier because I like to ask other people to do the hard work, and he's much smarter on this stuff than me. Uh, but he cited an example called the U.S. Web Design System. The U.S. WDS is a design system for the federal government in the U.S., and it's pretty simple. It's a bunch of patterns. It's a bunch of shorthand notes that you can include in your code to ensure that everything has a consistent standard, but it's still open source. Uh, in French, one of them in France, one of the most popular APIs is the address API. And it's simply you use the code that the French government gives you as this API, and it automatically encodes and finds addresses very quickly. So you're standing on the shoulders of other pieces of open code and open service that allow you to make your application more accessible, more inclusive, faster, better design, more consistent. Those are the kinds of philosophies that I see being a huge advantage in government because the challenge we face right now is that 
government is a big tech firm. It just hasn't realized it yet. And everything government is doing is moving information around across departments and then presenting a common interface to the end user. And so if government's a big tech firm, it needs to start thinking about building services, building APIs, building consistency. And I'm very disappointed to say that in Canada, the most requested database that we have is a postal code database, which is still under debate by the government of Canada, even though postal codes are a crown corporation run by Canada Post. We just like a thing that lets you type in an address and get a postal code and vice versa. So governments need to start building atop this open source with open compute, open data, open metadata, the entire open stack, if they are to realize the special variant of a digital um, big tech firm that they are. It starts with open source, and I'm very eager to hear from David, who obviously knows way more about this than I do. Um, but I do think that open source is dictated by how we break up. And if you look at a system that you're dependent on and you can't leave it, that's an abusive relationship and you need some counseling. So I'll hand things over to David now. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Alistair. Thank you so much, um, Deborah uh, and Michael, for hosting us. Um, so my name is David Ease. I'm a lecturer of public policy here at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, where I really focus on digital transformation. So thinking about how governments are skilling themselves up and doing strategy to become the tech companies that they actually are, as Alistair noted. Um, my background actually, interestingly, I started my career off in the negotiation space and then ended up doing a lot of negotiation work for open source communities, really helping them think about how do they manage themselves as communities. And that's what pulled me into the tech sector. And then out of that, began to think a lot about how governments could be using both open source code, but really kind of um, uh, as Alistair said, kind of open ideologies for thinking about how they deliver and create public goods, um, which ultimately led me here to be thinking about and teaching about digital transformation. Um, this is like way back in the day. These are some of the organizations that I either advised or I've given talks to and, and kind of coached, um, thinking about the kind of management of open architectures and open systems for collaborating uh, public goods. So maybe just first quickly, because I'm not sure that we've completely done this, just thinking very, very briefly about like what open source is. Um, I'm gonna have a less kind of grand view than Alistair, who I think is right to think about it as a philosophy and just more very, very, very tactically. Um, you know, it's a project where um, the people, anyone can really modify, share or contribute because the design or the underlying code, the kind of the infrastructure or the, the building blocks of the project are accessible. And for me, kind of like the key part of this is actually the there's a legal contract. So for me, when you really boil it down, what open source is about is a legal contract, which is a license that allows you to do those things. And um, there's no one license. I mean, my assumption is many people on the, co on the call are actually familiar with open source already. So I'm not gonna go into all this, but really when you boil things down, like this is the firm ground that you are standing on. There's a legal contract that allows you to go and participate, to share, to use, to contribute, um, the code base or to be part of that community. So I think if you're a government official and you're thinking about open source, it's really important that you have that foundational understanding and that you be, go and say, this is what we need to put in place because without this, you really, you know, you can be open, but there's real limits to what you're doing. Um, so what are some examples, just really kind of, you know, brass tacks examples of governments engaged in open source type projects? And, um, been really fortunate to talk to a number of government officials who've done work in this space. And I'm gonna give you three different examples or four different examples that kind of touch on different types. So the first is there was a very simple tool built on a website at the beginning of the COVID crisis in Alberta, which was a self-assessment tool, basically designed to allow people to answer questions on their own. So they wouldn't call the government and put pressure on the phone lines. And so it's just very, very simple. This is like almost like a flat file that you can just drop on a website and um, this was so compelling that other provinces in Canada called up Alberta and said, hey, could we, we'd like to build this ourselves rather than building it from scratch, can we just borrow yours? And so now you're looking at a very similar self-assessment tool that Ontario government has that has, is basically leveraging a lot of the code and the work that Alberta did. And so this is a great example of kind of in some, a very light form of open source where you build something and then I say, wow, that's really amazing. I'd like that too. Would you just ship it to me? Would you give it to me? And so they give you the, the files, they give you the kind of the data and you're able to build it. And um, Ontario then in turn turned around and put that code base on GitHub. 
and then multiple other provinces and actually other st like states and private companies have all used this code base to build, build their own self-assessment tool for COVID. Um, maybe like a little more complicated is this project here. Um, this is gov.uk gov notify, which is a kind of alert system. So text messaging, email also sends letters that you can append to any service. So like, um, you know, you have a bail hearing coming up, it'll remind you about the, when the bail hearing is. You need to pay your taxes, it'll remind you to pay your taxes. Any government can go and grab, the, sorry, any government agency in the UK can grab the service and attach it to a service they offer to remind their citizens of something. Um, a, couple, uh, a year and a half, two years ago, I convened digital service teams from around the world here in Cambridge. Um, the UK government presented on this, and then uh, several other governments said, we'd like that. And so the UK government made this project open source. And so now there's a, a similar service available in Canada. So this is an example of it here, really running on the same code base. And again, also in Australia and Brazil, I believe is launching one of theirs as well soon. Another example of this, because uh, we're speaking to uh, our friends in India, um, this is MOSIP, which is started by the Omidyar Foundation. It's an open source version of ADHAR, so a biometric identity system um, that's being rolled out in Morocco and the Philippines. And the effort here is how do we think of something core as like a national um, citizen registry and how do we make that core infrastructure open so governments aren't relying on proprietary software in a specific vendor. And then maybe kind of most famously in the digital government space, there's the, um, the X Road by Estonia, which is the system by which they manage the sharing of data across the, the Estonian government. It too has been open sourced and is now used by the Finnish government and very soon the Icelandic government um, to kind of basically serve as a data operating system for how that government shares data. And that's actually managed as Deborah argued about, uh, kind of shared about by a foundation. So this is a, there's a kind of formal body that's overseeing the sharing of this code. So those are some various examples that I've just shared. What I like about these, these examples is, is if you're in government, they kind of span the various types of software that the government would be think, needing to think about. So uh, Richard Pope, who is a fellow with me, talks about how you have software that's kind of citizen facing. It's kind of usually on the web or it's a simple app. Then you have some common infrastructure, which is things that are used across agencies, the shared software infrastructure like authentication, um, notification, payments. And then there's data registries where you store core information about citizens or assets. And the examples I just shared with you are nice because they actually span all of these different areas um, and as you get kind of deeper in the stack, often you kind of get more complex as you go down. So spend all of those. So one of the things you need to be thinking about if you're gonna be doing open source is just what are the risks that we're trying to mitigate? And there's a few. So one is there's a real challenge of responsibility in the open source space with many, many hands building software, who's ultimately responsible for a mistake or a problem. And, and many governments are often not comfortable launching going into open source because they wanna have, the, the lawyers wanna know who's ultimately accountable. And this is one dilemma that we're trying to solve. The other dilemma is, what's the sustainability of that project? So you might have an open source project, but if you're just relying on a group of like, you know, volunteers that live around the world, maybe who aren't getting paid, if your critical infrastructure is sitting on top of that, that's maybe a kind of concern that we should be having. And so this is one of the reasons why I think um, as more governments engage in thinking about open source, we need to be thinking more and more about what the governance of that open source is and what it looks like for governments to be engaged in that governance. Um, when I, uh, the, over the, like the coming year and over the past year, we've been looking more and more at like the types of open source projects that exist in governments. And really there's kind of like very three very simple buckets. So there's some places where there's basically no community where you're just kind of sharing code and you're like, go do your thing. I don't really care. Like, you know, don't tell me anything that you do. Just use what I've done. I'm happy to help you, but just go away. There's sometimes there's an informal community, which is where, you know, I share my code with you. Hey, I'd like to hear how it works. Show me any lessons you have, but we're not kind of formally collaborating. And at the very end is this formal community. These are the foundations that Deborah was talking about and the explosion of those that are taking place around the world suggests that there's more and more desire kind of for more formal structures. But this comes with real overhead and costs and shouldn't be just taken on lightly. When I, I go back to the examples that I just shared with you, hopefully you can kind of see how each one of those falls in one of these approaches. So that COVID self-assessment tool, you know, one brought government's just sharing with the other, like, hey, go do what you want with it. Just don't, don't call me back, I'm okay. This is a no community approach. Whereas the gov.uk notify where the UK government shared it with the other governments, the UK, Australia, and Brazil, they're just like some light touch between them. They're learning from each other, but they're not sharing a common uh, code base. So over time, this code could evolve and become distinct projects. 
But then over here, the, the MOSIP example and the XROAD, those are formal communities where the code base is being managed. And we're going to jointly manage that risk and ensure that the code base stays similar across all the projects. The contributions are formally structured, and we're thinking about how we're going to resource it and ensure that it survives over time. And often we're actually putting hard cash into the maintenance and management of this of these services and of this foundation. And here you can see like the background of the of what's called NIS, the Nordic Institute for Interoperability Standards, which manages the X Road. This is like this is where governments are really comfortable. So we have a history here. We have like treaties that are being signed. We have lawyers who are in the room setting up formal structures. Um, this again, I think, is what a future is going to look like for a lot of governments when it comes to this code, particularly as that code becomes core to the operation of those governments. And you can see here again, they have really clear governance models. I'm not going to dive into this. We can dive into more in, in, in the questions. Um, there's lots of examples, as Deborah mentioned, an explosion of this. Um, I'm really excited to see more and more of these. I'm kind of studying varying of the, various of them. Um, this is one I've been looking at for like over a decade now, which is Kuali, which is a basically a community of universities that are sharing code to manage the core infrastructure of universities. I think it's a really interesting model that we're going to see of more in government because universities and governments kind of similar in many ways. And of course, in India, uh, I think there's a real explosion of this type of approach in the public sector. Um, uh, organizations like the eGov Foundation have been fascinating to me to watch as I think they're starting to touch on and think about these types of issues. I'm really keen to learn more about them. So uh, this is all going to rise to a bunch of new challenges, which is like how are governments going to procure open source software? Um, I think one of the key things is when you're looking to buy, uh, when you're looking to buy normally, you're like, hey, there's a company we just assume they're sustainable. When you're going to go use open source projects, it's now you have to assess both the code, but what you really are assessing is the health of the community and the ecosystem. And that doesn't that doesn't like lie all in a company, and so it's a much more complicated job, and so that's going to require some new skills. And, and then participating in these foundations and participating in these communities is to require some new skills from government, some of which I think they're very familiar with, like setting up foundations and governance. Others that are less familiar with is just working and sharing things in the open, often not comfortable for governments. And it's going to require some new approaches, maybe some new, a little bit of new culture and some new skills. So I'm going to stop there, but I hope this was an interesting opening. That was wonderful, David. And I guess the main question, first question I have is, uh, is there a way to make those slides available? Do you have a URL that you could post in the chat? Um, and also, yeah, Deb, okay. I think that would be incredibly helpful. Uh, you win the award for the best cartoon of the day. Uh, and I, I do want to get <clears throat> the source for that as well. I hope people are looking in the chat and see many of the URLs that Alistair and myself and others are posting. Uh, we've started to have a bit of a conversation there, but I'd, I'd ask that people uh, bring their ideas into the chat and ask questions. Let me let me do a little futuring here. Uh, part of my job at Carnegie and my work at Georgetown has been around figuring out where we're going to be in 5, 10, even 20 years into the future. And in the discussion, we've heard a lot about some of the things that are happening and could happen. <clears throat> um, Things in Estonia like the X road are a nice example of what can happen when there's a, a unified authentication system. Um, we're seeing a lot of these data platforms in, in Taiwan, there's G, uh, Gov Zero. Um, and obviously in India, you've got a major uh, open source, I mean, open data initiative. But what, what are we missing? So I'll, I'll ask the panelists and anybody on the on the chat who wants to chime in as all as well. What 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 is the the the, the key piece of infrastructure that that hasn't been deployed, at least widely? What and and, and in many cases it's going to have to be open source because people are going to want to do a lot of different things with this infrastructure, and they're going to want to trust it. And one of the reasons open source is so valuable as people can challenge it, they can look at it, they can they can see that it's good. So what what is the killer application or that what's the what's the most exciting new piece of infrastructure that you think is going to develop in the next couple of years? Um, Alistair, Dave, Deb? Yeah, uh, maybe if I'll, I'll just jump in here just because I spent a lot of time looking at, at governments around the world. I, I, so one thing is I don't think it's a new piece of infrastructure actually um, prefer my governments using kind of old and known known things rather than sitting right on the very bleeding edge. Um, but I think the the one thing that the Estonians have shown us and and that you know has been chronicled in India, you know, Nenna Nilakeni has written lots of this, is that if you don't have 
unique identifiers for your citizens that allow you to authenticate them and then move data about them around your public service, you really can operate in a digital era. And that leads to two pieces. So one is, I think there is a, a set of technologies to enable that. That's what I think MOSIP's trying to tackle. That's what Adahar's trying to tackle. So there's a set of technologies that needs to handle that. But I think equally critical and, and the much more difficult piece is gonna be the policy infrastructure. So this is a non-technology piece, but the policy infrastructure that's gonna allow people to have trust and confidence in that system. And so um, that's gonna be privacy acts, it's gonna be rules that allow, that allow people to know when their data is being shared and when it's not being shared. And I think we're still very, very early days. So um, in Canada, for example, uh, they're in the middle of a public consultation on, the, on renewing the Privacy Act because previously governments are not allowed to share data across agencies. They would like to be able to do that, but they're trying to figure out how do we do that in a way that preserves trust and safety. So there's this technology component that I actually don't think is all that new, but doesn't exist in many governments that we're building out, but there's this policy piece we've got to build out as well. Yeah, I think uh, absolutely digital identity is the cornerstone of any cross digital service delivery because, <coughs> excuse me, um, we often force the citizen to use the um, government's services according to the structure of government and we have to hide the ministries. If I want to move from one province to another, I'd like to just say I'm moving and have the tax systems and the health systems and the driving systems and so on just take care of that but today we force the citizen uh, to navigate the structure of government because of convenience to us as a government but i think the challenge here and and this is partly what david was saying is that we have to teach uh, ourselves as humans as humans who are part of this transitional human machine hybrid and like it or not we are in a chimeric era i have a device in my pocket that tells me what I'm doing every day with little red dots. And I'm somehow okay with that. That's 20 years new. And so we're becoming this digital chimera. The idea that technology, that we can have privacy is ludicrous. And I say that in a very tenuous way. Technology privacy is a set of trade-offs. I am willing to tell a computer system my location in return for amazing mapping. That's like a superpower. In any city in the world, I can find my way to the airport just by telling the computer where I am. But I've given up some privacy in doing so. And every one of these things is a trade-off. And until we start having a conversation about the trade-offs of technology and privacy of closed and open, we can't come up with good public policy. And I think one of the challenges in the world today is we are so polarized about the battle between the collective that follows the laws and follows governance and then the individual <clears throat> who believes freedom is basically doing whatever is not the norm and getting away with it we're going to have a very hard time coming up with common policy um there's one other thing that concerns me a lot and i'll i'll, I'll keep my remarks short with this uh, one last thing which is there's a strong movement towards what's called no code uh webflow uh, bubble io all these other technologies that allow a non-developer to build something whether you're just building a schema like Figma and pouring code behind it, or you're building a full-on stack like Bubble.io with a relational database behind it, there's no way that you have open source because you've dragged and dropped the interface. You can't take that code and move somewhere else. So I think that the, the rise of apps, the inability of citizens to think rationally about the trade-offs of technology and instead to somehow say that privacy is all or nothing, and the rise of the no code movement are the three biggest sort of tectonic shifts we're going to see in open source in the next couple of years. Those are three very big ideas and we'll dig a little deeper. Deb, do you have a thought on, on some key piece of the infrastructure that we're going to be building, <clears throat> something that will enable open source development? Well, I think uh, I, I think the prior speakers have covered it well, although I would say that we we the 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 use of the public and private clouds are go going to be huge um, i'd like to leave some room for other questions from the audience too so i'll keep my comments short we've got a comment from uh, santosh about the blockchain and that brings up i think <clears throat> one of the other opportunities here and that is tracking uh data <clears throat> my personal data in ways that allow me to know exactly who's looking at my data and um, what it's being used for. Uh, one of the things I'm most excited about are what are called data unions, 
Sandy Pentland at MIT has been an incredible advocate for this, and he has a new book out called Building the New Economy. And it explains a world in which I will have my data, data about me, not necessarily my data, but data about me. It could be my Facebook posts, it could be my financial data, it could be my the health, the data that my healthcare providers have generated about me. Um, it could be my personal directory. Who knows? I mean, all this different data that I'm leaving behind <clears throat> could be stored not by Facebook or by my doctor's office, but instead by a third party. And so I would have a relationship with a data union. It would be like my relationship with my bank. My bank takes care of my money and it collects a lot of data about me, but it's responsible for that data and that money and it's got a contract with me. And if it doesn't take care of my data, there's a lot of, of damage of, of punishment that can be exerted on that on that entity. <clears throat> and the idea would be that these data unions would serve all sorts of different purposes, uh, collecting data from billions of people. They could make their data available in anonymized form for all sorts of machine learning applications that could lead to better government, better uh, medicine, uh, better environmental monitoring. There's uh, all sorts of ways that this data could be used. But the key thing would be that it's held by these parties who are responsible and auditable and accountable to the people who have provided the data. So that that's another piece, missing piece. We don't have this structure of data unions and i would i would uh, urge everyone to read sandy pentman's new book um let me let me so ask I, I, i'd like to comment on that actually because that's a really wonderful vision but i'm going to take a minute to throw my own country the united states under the bus and our industry so why is it that we've not had health record banks i cannot find a personal health record bank why can't we solve that problem we forced the entire medical uh, industry uh, in, into keeping electronic health records, and I still can't get my stuff, and I still can't match it up. So it, I think it comes back to David's comment a, a, about policy. We we lack the policy infrastructure at, at times because of vested interests, because a hospital on this side of town doesn't want a hospital on that side of town to know they release someone with a staph infection. There's, you know, follow the money. So I, I think that these things are not going to become possible unless we do the harder policy work. It's not a great, elegant technical solution. I'm excited about the technology, but I think we still have uh, miles to go uh, in, in terms of uh, policy and governance. Off to I, I think talks. just just to, to, to add to that a little bit, um, I gave a talk a few years ago uh, on the sort of darkening of our lives. If you go back in time to circa 1996, you can find the first evidence of Aleister Crowley existing on the internet when I posted some pictures. And then, you know, when I got a Facebook account or when Google Maps started tracking my locations, each of these things was a moment where there was more and more data about me. And I think a digital bill of rights will ultimately have to include the lines, nobody should know more about me than I do. It's okay for people to know about me, but when a third party provider creates information about metadata about me, I should have access to that. And this, you know, you're absolutely right that, that um, these, uh, these health records are a problem, but that's not all of it. There's my driving records, there's my tax records, there's my vaccination history, there's any criminal records I might have. There's, there's a timeline by which I think humans are going to want to manage their lives. And the most useful thing you could give me, and the closest thing today I have is email, where I go and search my email, which is the log file of my online life. Like email is the tail of the log file of my life. Most of my mails are not actually mails anymore. They're like receipts and updates and notifications and copies. We are we need this log file of our online lives because it's the memory of our digital doppelgangers. And at the moment, that information is held by dozens of other organizations who are not accountable to us. And I think that's the ultimate piece of policy that needs to exist is there needs to be a rule that says nobody should know more about you than you do. And when that information becomes available because it's created through metadata or surveillance capitalism or whatever, it's now part of that log file I can use to run my life to defend myself in court to hold others accountable. I think without that, we are a long way away from the sort of social justice for our online selves that we're going to need.
Well, David mentioned at least four times lawyers and legal barriers. And I, I do want to delve into that a little bit. But let, let me let me go back to the question we had about blockchain. And, and we've heard all sorts of people saying that this is the magic, that somehow this is what's what's going to provide the glue that ties together uh, open government systems, e-business systems. I'm not talking about cryptocurrency here and, and Bitcoin. I, I'm, I'm really interested in knowing how you think blockchain might play into this and whether it's a robust enough tool to solve some of the problems we've been talking about. I'm, uh, I confess I'm, a, I'm more of a skeptic, uh, certainly at the moment for several reasons, but one is, uh, you know, um, when people talk about the blockchain, they're usually talk, they usually they, talk, they, they get two things confused. They talk about either like, a, you know, there's a distributed ledger and then there's the permission ledger. And so if you're, so if you're gonna go with a, you know, the distributed ledger, you're really inviting a governance nightmare to your database because mm -hmm. now anytime you wanna make a change, you're gonna have to roll that change back. Or if you make a mistake, you wanna roll that change back. You now have to go get the permission of 51%, 50% 50, 50 plus one of the people involved. Um, and I don't want to do that. Like the whole reason I have a government is I have a set of policies to figure out like how do how do problems get resolved, how do disputes get resolved. Like I have a there's a court system, there's a bureaucracy that's all designed to do that. I don't want to go to a group of people so that we can self organize and figure out how to do that. There's like there's an enormous amount of governance overhead you've now just imposed on that system. So and not only that, but the system isn't necessarily safe. Um, if one if one presumes that it's so distributed that nobody could have 50% plus one and they just make decisions themselves, but I can think of some large state actors that maybe do have the computational power to own 50% plus one of, of, you know, particularly a smaller blockchain. So I'm not really sure what is buying us other than a lot of governance overhead. Um, now, if you go to a permission blockchain, I'm like, well, now you just are basically running an immutable database. So why don't you just run an immutable database? I just don't get it. So I, I, I think there are going to be, this is to be clear, I do think there are places where the blockchain will be useful, um, but I'm not sure that it's kind of the panacea that, that people I kind of thought it was. And, and it's really, the fact that we don't hear much about it either means that it's in the, the Gartner trial of disillusionment for an exceedingly long period of time, or that maybe people are starting to realize that these challenges are very, very hard to overcome. Okay. Let me let me turn to the bigger question of where else we see policy barriers to the development of open source, open data solutions. Alistair, you've worked with so many people around Canada and around the world. Where do they end up hitting their heads against lawyers? Uh, everywhere. Um, I think you need to look at the percentage of politicians in Congress and the Senate that have a law degree. Uh, and then that tells you exactly how much of uh, politics is law. And I think this has been a precursor to the sort of cult of personality we're seeing where we don't vote on a particular, um, we don't vote on a particular topic. We vote on a legal framework, uh, whether that framework is towards independence or collectivism or whatever. Uh, and we argue legal frameworks and, and most policies are a consequence of the opening arguments of a legal position. That's kind of my cynical view of looking at some governments. I think that um, the real challenge is, as David says, um, blockchain's not a panacea. Uh, if you are Disney, you don't need blockchain to manage your tickets. You just have a serial number and make sure your tickets aren't counterfeited and then you're done, right? Like blockchain, uh, whenever someone says, what can I use blockchain for? They've already lost because the word I tells you that you can't use it. Blockchain is great for when, so here's my take on blockchain as a generic rule. I assume most people are familiar with the idea of game theory and the Nash equilibrium, that you have parties that play a game a certain way and something has to change their behavior to get them to change their outcome. And so if I had, for example, all the newspapers of the world, they all wanna sell me $14 a month subscriptions, but I don't wanna pay $14 a month to read the sports section of uh, the Globe and Mail newspaper. I just wanna read its tech section. So none of these, it would be much better for those companies if I paid $40 a month and had access to all of their publications. And if every newspaper in the world got together and said, we're gonna put a plug in on Alistair's browser. And when he reads our page, we get a micro payment that's settled through some analytics that are on the blockchain. Cause we don't trust each other. But if this happens, now we all get a share of that $40 a month, including some random blogger that I decide is interesting on Medium. 
I've now created a new Nash equilibrium for paid media, which would be great, by the way, because falsehoods are are free, but paid media is expensive. So blockchains are good. That's a good example because there's a bunch of uh, stakeholders who disagree with one another and need to come to agreement. And as David said, the governance is there, but the benefits of tipping the Nash equilibrium into this new state outweigh the costs of the governance and overhead. And there's much less requirement for uh, trust in that model. Um, and so uh, Cherian mentioned this, and I'll just respond to it in the chat. Um, in the atomic world, certain things are cheap and certain things are expensive. So uh, it's very expensive for me to make an identical copy of something. There's no such thing because it's made from different atoms in an atomic world. In a digital world, making a copy of something is immediate and free. We almost take it for granted, right? The you know Personalization was very expensive in the atomic world. There were three or four major newspapers. Now, billions of people have a different news feed tailored just to them and the opinions that they're gonna agree with. So clearly personalization got really cheap by the same token, authenticity got really expensive. I have a cup of coffee, sadly an empty one, right here. And I know you don't have this cup of coffee because I have it. I wish it had coffee in it, but I have it. And I have no doubt about that because it's a physical, tangible good. And blockchain and cryptocurrency can imbue digital things with physical-like attributes. And so in a world of deep fakes and fake news and falsehoods, we build trust based on provenance and veracity. And I think that's the place where not necessarily the blockchain, but crypto like um, calculations that can imbue atomic properties on digital goods will allow us to make this transition to a digital world where new things are abundantly cheap, like personalization, and new things are incredibly expensive, like veracity and authenticity. I've just made Cherry a uh, participant who can speak up if he wants to, but I thought he had a couple other very good questions, uh, which I will read, uh, unless he wants to to chime in. So, Cherry, do you want to to chime in and ask your question about open washing or follow up on on Alistair's comments? You're muted. I don't hear him. So let me let me read his his question here. There is a trend of open washing in large public scale technology projects where the government is on record saying that they have no idea about who is accountable or responsible and who built the platform. And I think we talked a little bit about this earlier about how do governments evaluate open source projects and decide whether it's safe to rely on them. Have you seen governments figure this one out? Because th at the end of the day, this is what lawyers want. This is what politicians want. They want to know who to blame when something doesn't work. Deb, you've, you've had to deal with this and when Red Hat goes in and provides solutions. How do, you, how do you answer people who say, who's in charge of this? Well, so it's an interesting question. And I want to make sure I understand it when you're using the term open washing. I usually think of that as uh, the suggestion that something uh, is open source when it's really not. Or if you're using it in a way where you're saying government's shifting and saying they can't they can't use open source. But I'll just I'll just punt. Uh, so m most of my experience in the space comes from the work I did at the university and when I was working in government and. I found that open source was really an important asset. Red Hat is in the business of uh, of uh, supporting software in a way that the government is comfortable for, and that's that was a business opportunity for Red Hat, even though the software is all open source and the government could do it themselves. So there's there's a level of assurity, but I would say that we're we're moving beyond that, where we're finding governments uh, are making their way through. I, I, I will, I'll give, uh, I'll be kind to, to my own country to say that they have made great inroads and raised people's levels of comfort. So as an example, years ago, uh, the Office of Budget Management came out with an executive statement that's that said that open source is commercial software. When you procure uh, software, you can consider open source among those choices. So at least in the US, we've gone beyond those conversations in large part for the with the people I've been working with over time in government and in, uh, in, uh, in, in other related agencies that built a level of confidence that government sh did understand how it would work. There are, there are outlying agencies that still that still have that question, but for the most part, through education and advocacy, 
and demonstration projects, we've been able to demonstrate that open source works and you don't have to have a contract. I, famously, for myself, I spoke at the State Department and I there was asked to give a talk on, uh, on the misconceptions of open source software. And I got tired of talking about the FUD, so I flipped it. And I said, well, here's misconceptions about proprietary software. Things like the company will always be in business and you'll always have that throat to choke. And, what CIO in this room has ever sued a software company for a breach of contract or actually used the code that they put in a repository? So you can break this down pretty quickly. There are, are governments in, in the world that have been successful and, uh, and, and, and folks like David and others are, uh, have played a role in making that kind of information available. And another way to make progress really is peer to peer, where we, we get someone in government to find someone on peer because there's no more trusted relationship than someone else that's walking in your shoes and doing the work. Well, you've mentioned State Department, so it's time to get into geopolitics. And our, our first question was actually from Sachin Tawari. And the question was, how is geopolitics shaping the open source, especially taking into account data regulation restrictions? And, and this really gets to about three really hard questions all at once. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd welcome any thoughts on this, but it, it, the reason this is such a hard question is because it highlights that open source isn't just the code, it's often the, the, the data <clears throat> that makes the code useful. And as we move more and more towards machine learning and using applications that rely on terabytes of data, it's going to be about who controls the data, can it flow across borders, and as we've seen in India and in the United States, it's going to be about whose code do you trust? Whether it's open source or proprietary, there's going to be more and more geopolitics involved in which types of code from which countries are allowed to run on computers in my country. So let's let's challenge this one. Is anybody anybody got a, a, a positive forecast here? I, I'm very negative here. I'm very concerned that more and more countries are starting to see code developed in other countries as a threat. And since open source is often developed in many different countries, it gets it, it makes it even harder to know uh, that it's safe or not, uh, not coming from a country that is uh, at odds with another country. Uh. I find your concern about this actually surprising um, because I actually think open source is the path out of the very dilemma that you're mentioning. And so I think one of the reasons, so I think countries actually are legitimately concerned about code that's written in other countries for several reasons. So one is, um, you know, there's one piece about this is um, kind of economic development and industrial policy, which is that for a long time, um, you know, your reliance on another country's code uh, was basically like, oh, we were actually dependent upon them. And, you know, we were exporting dollars that were going to go and fund software developers that happened to list in another, happened to live in another country. And I think some people's concern over like the, the dominance of Microsoft and the government stack was that, you know, I think like less a security issue and more just kind of like a, you know, balance of trade problem. Um, but then there were security problems that were laid on top of that. And I think now more people are kind of looking around being like, yeah, like the Estonians want to export the X-Road, the Indians want to export Adhar, the Chinese want to export their own kind of government platforms. And I think this kind of competition on some ways is good. It's good from a technology perspective. It's maybe also good from a ideology and, and policy perspective to have these competing different ideas. But I think there ultimately will be kind of concern about like, well, who ultimately owns the code? And then what does that mean both from an economic development perspective, but what does it mean from a security perspective? And the kind of the opportunity, kind of the, the open source foundations that Deborah was mentioning in her presentation is it does allow for multiple governments to scrutinize and that might actually increase trust. It also sucks some of the proprietary value out that makes it less about economic development and one player winning and allows for kind of localization and participation domestically in that software, which, which could both allow it to be more widely used but more distributedly um, created. Yeah. You mentioned all these different national projects from Estonia to to India and elsewhere. Is there any force that's going to pull countries together and get those different projects 
to be interoperable in some ways. We're, we're not going to have the global platform, but to get to a place where we have interoperability, where my identity in India can be used to buy something in Estonia and ship it to Brazil. I, mean, it, it, I don't see any forces that are pulling people together around common standards and interoperability. Am I, am I wrong? Is there something else out there that could be developed that would be the glue? Well, a, the, an inherent part of open source are open standards. So in fact, many of these platforms are, are built for interoperability. It just becomes a local decision about whether or not there's adoption and use. Not every project is useful. Uh, and one of the better ideas in open source is you shouldn't start from scratch. So in the sense where no one's taking advantage of existing code, it, it, it's silly. One of the challenges in the years I was running the Government Open Source Conference, which is really a nonprofit platform for convening state and local and then eventually a federal agencies to discuss projects and collaborate, was that so, uh, these entities loved starting an open source project and they loved sharing, but it was harder for them to join other projects. And I've seen that for years, unless there's really a compelling force, uh, but they're all because it is built on open platforms, there's no no uh, barrier to interoperability. It's more around adoption and, and localization and use. That's my overly simplified way of thinking about it. So I, I, just to say again, you know, the technology can work together, but at the end of the day, the governments have to work together. They have to accept each other's data and they have to actually make it work together and and that's that's the the, the challenge the the lack of trust and the inability for data to flow in some cases countries are putting data localization requirements in place that will make it hard for me to take my identity and and use it somewhere else so so I, I, is there a place we can look to for hope i mean the oecd is trying to do some work on these some of these topics uh, the G20 is certainly a place where the, the global leaders come together, but I, I don't know that they're going to be talking about data unions and digital identity at that level. Is, is there some way we can we can just just get everybody to work together a little bit more at, at, at the at the CIO level? I, I haven't well, seen like I mean, that's an ambitious question. Do you know, does anybody have anti-gravity boots or hoverboards would be, yeah. Like these are great things. I think we need to, we need to build on a, we need to very strategically build on a, on, on a framework. Uh, one thing I think we don't spend enough time talking about is OAuth. Uh, it's another open, right? The open authentication protocol. Today, I am willing to single sign on with LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or Google. These are foreign owned public corporations that have shareholders in whom I have no recourse. The federal government of Canada, where I happen to live, could uh, have its own OAuth, and I could sign in with a trusted cert or credential or token from an open authentication service from the federal government of Canada. I have legal recourse because I elected the people in charge of it. But more importantly, someone who's 75 and doesn't understand the workings of the internet and is signed into sites that are bad actors can be saved from those bad actors by the open by the authentication provider revoking credentials. So there's actually a mechanism to drive accountability into these things. Does that solve open source? No. But if you start, if you say, I have this thing for provenance and I have this other thing for, um, you know, pulling all my data into a repository. Uh, another thing that we haven't really talked about is open algorithms. Today, um, there are lots of algorithms used on me, very few algorithms used for me. And I believe that I'd like an AI that works on my behalf where there's objective function is maximize Alistair's happiness, wealth, safety, whatever I choose to be the objective function of my life, have an algorithm chewing on my data, making recommendations for me, whether that's don't have a snack at two in the morning or read this book, it's really relevant to you, or here are some important friends you haven't talked to in a while who are going through a hard time. That would be an amazing agent that would augment me that doesn't exist. So explainability and algorithms, like there's so many places where we can start this stack OAuth, open algorithms, open data feeds. And I think many of them come from government <clears throat> because 
the incentives of the private sector are a little perverse. And when you have, um, we have no problem asking a government to build a highway. For some reason, we don't want a building broadband, stay the hell out of my broadband. But we haven't redrawn the lines between the public and the private sector in a world where we are now these digital chimera. And I think we're gonna have to do that either proactively or, or it's just gonna be done for us under some new authoritarian government or whatever. We have to chart a path to a digital bill of rights that has authentication and veracity and accountability and the ability to own your own data and build on these building blocks and gradually earn the trust of a citizenry that is rightly very nervous about this new digital frontier. David, do you have any thoughts on this question of how we can get digital cooperation and more digital leadership so that different government solutions start working together? So I think, well, there's a few thoughts. One is, I really want to just, if I was going to rank order the things in the world that I think need to be solved, I'm just not sure this hits my top 10 list. Like, this is a problem that, you know, a very small privileged set of people who travel internationally have. And when I think about problems of global poverty, I'm much more interested in solving identity challenges at the local level within a country than I am solving about, you know, can David Eves be, you know, go show up in Estonia or in Bangalore and be able to authenticate who I am. I'm much more interested in ensuring that the poor rural farmer in Nigeria is able to authenticate who they are so they can engage in a financial transaction. And I'm just not sure that we need a global regime to solve that problem. Would it be nice? Yes, but I just don't think it's essential. Um, so uh, I'm much, I am much more interested in figuring out kind of what the national regimes are at the moment. I would love to have an eye at a at kind of beginning to think about what a global regime looks like. But I really, frankly, kind of only an eye on it because I'm also not sure um, if I want, you know, my national government sharing all sorts of data with me to, with other national governments without me having some sort of agency over that. And so I'm, I'm pretty cautious. I, I would also separate, like, what are the use cases here? So there's a commercial interest I might have in being able to authenticate who I am, but I really, I don't like, I just don't see what the problem is. I have no problem authenticating the David use the David use when I travel around the world or making payments. Like there is a whole commercial industry that's solving that problem. So the question is, is what's the government interest in being able to do that? Why does the government want to be able to track who David Eves and then share that? You have a hard time selling me on what the salient problem is that we're solving and doing that. Well, I, I guess the, the, the thought in my head is that if we have a system that is shown to be interoperable, particularly for small countries, it's going to be a lot more uh, uh, simple for them to embrace that. You know, if there if there is a way to say, okay, here's something that 55 countries have all done, and here's a standard they're building to. They're doing it differently, but you do have this ability to you know, have a migrant worker in another country authenticated by their home country and they can function uh, even though they're not a citizen of the, the country where they're a resident. And, and that, so this, this idea that people will be uh, able to easily work across borders um, will make it a more powerful tool, even for people who are staying at home and never leaving, or staying in their own village and never leaving. Uh, there, there are ways in which I could I could see just getting over the barrier of implementation. There's so, so few countries have put a, a digital identity system in place. And I have to believe if there was a, a wider consensus on how to do it, that we would move faster. But we can we can argue about this later. I fully agree with you that we're not here to solve the jetsetters problem. We're here to solve a uh, we're trying. We're trying to make a system work that that. I get it, but, the problem, but the problems here aren't technical. The problems are policy. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the, the challenge is for me. The challenge is not like it's not. Can we agree to a standard? It's that the notions of privacy will vary enormously from country to country, and the capabilities. Like so, like I'm ner I'm somewhat nervous about Adhar in India, but at least in India, there's a very vibrant civil society. That's, that has challenged the government and insisted that there should be a privacy law, even though the courts have basically, and, and, and there's a court system that's relatively independent that says, yes, there should be, I think there's a lot of gray, at least still in India, and that you know, it, you know, the demands for Privacy Act maybe have carbos that prevent government having to adhere to it. So everybody thinks they're winning right now. So I think it's actually a mess in India, but at least that debate can happen. There's all sorts of countries where 
I'm not convinced that there's a robust enough civil society and independent judiciary where you're going to have that debate. And I'm not sure I'd want to roll out a system or have a stand, an, an international standard that satisfies India that doesn't satisfy those types of countries and what that standard might look like across those. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing it at the moment. Now, one of the most exciting talks I've heard in the last three months was on Friday afternoon. I'm part of a group called the People Centered Internet. And Sam Palmasano, who was the former CEO of IBM, did a presentation on a consortium that he's forming to create a charter for a new data consortium. It, it, the idea is to put in place some principles that could enable these data unions that we were talking about earlier and could enable um, different entities to be more accountable to citizens who would then be more willing to share more data about themselves and to, to, to use more applications relying on that data. And, and it, it, it's, it's really, it's got a lot of high level participation and it is trying to get directly at the questions that you were asking. You know, what happens if you're operating in a government in a country where the government doesn't respect privacy? How can corporations show that they're doing the right thing and that applications are being built the right way? Um, I, 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 but I, I, I'm glad you highlighted this because this this difference in how privacy is respected is is the fundamental one. We're down to the last ten minutes. We've got a great question here from Robin Zachariah Tharakan, and let me just read it. My question is around the role of community in these public digital goods. Very often community participation or expectation of collective action comes up only once the underlying infrastructures are designed and released by a single government or entity, which affects the trust around these solutions. How can community be involved in thinking through the solution versus being expected to build on top of an offering? Uh, we talked a little bit, uh, Alistair, you talked very eloquently about this, about how, how do you avoid being locked into somebody else's cloud service thoughts? You know, how do we, how do we have openness throughout the system? Anyone else? Uh, you're on, on mute, Alistair. Does anybody else have thoughts on how to get... Uh, I'm just trying to let involved? someone else chime in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, yes. So, uh, governments in, in general are not very good at community. It is the thing, and I think David, you know, can reflect on this too. It's the thing that I get the most calls for help about when they pass their new, uh, the U.S. government passed their new open source policy. I've gone to the White House to sit in on the round round tables as an OSI board member. Uh, and after that was implemented, the first phone call I got was, can we ask you for help with community? Uh, it, they, it's, a, it's a big struggle for government. They need to get better at it. And building something without an anticipation of a participatory community is really rough. Uh, and again, I, I'd really love to hear David's view on this. My view is that I don't think government should be building a lot of stuff right now. I think they should be focusing on how to get data available for communities, specific communities of interest to be able to build upon that. I mean, a great example is uh, after uh, uh, major uh, wars in the Middle East, we had a, a tremendous up uh, spike in veterans coming home who were horribly served by the department, who were having trouble finding resources, who were having trouble filling out forms. And the, the, the United States Veterans uh, Agency released the information on what the process looked like to the open source community and a bunch of developers wrote a way to be able to connect people with people in the community to provide the information they need to speed the process. And that took that government being willing to open up 
data that they didn't previously have. And so there was a poll from a community of interest that were interested in seeing the application be developed. I think government needs to spend less time building stuff and more time focusing on the business they're in. I know we talk about them as being a technical platform. Uh, Tim O'Reilly used to talk about government as a platform years ago when they ran their government 2.0 thing at the beginning of the Obama administration. But I, I, it's my heartfelt desire to see government get better uh, at, at doing that. And, and part of the challenge is also is, is around money and budget. So a really simple example, in the state of Oregon, uh, uh, when I served there, they, they wanted to build a, uh, a centralized voting system to make it easier for people to register and reduce uh, duplication and reduce fraud and registration. The local counties absolutely refused to go along. They said, no way. Why? Because the counties were, were making a revenue by selling address labels for the voter rolls to people that were running for office. And this was a, 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 a permanent part of their revenue source. So some, so you have to, you have to take the, you have to follow the money sometimes and figure out, you know, how that's impacting government. So my, my contention is you need to focus on data. And if you're going to build something, I don't, I can't tell you how particularly government should bring a community in sooner, but, but governments need to get better at partnering with community. And uh, David, if you have some uh, additional comments. I know this has been an area of endeavor for you for quite a few years. Yeah, maybe like a few things to say. I think, Deborah, you, you're gonna have a tough time with this audience because I actually think if there's one country where um, the renegotiation of what is a public good and who should be building it has been profound, like that debate has been profoundly altered and has really shifted my own thinking, it's India, where the government really is building core, in, like is building open source core infrastructure to be shared across multiple jurisdictions. And I think it's actually quite exciting um, and how India has redefined what a public good is. And I mean, everything from Adahar to UPI, like there's just, for me, it's fascinating. And so um, I actually think the notion that government shouldn't build, is, um, that's a, as a very American view. And actually for much of the world, um, there is an expectation that the government should build and that this is public infrastructure. And some of that may involve outsourcing, but actually it probably requires a certain capability in house to build and maintain um, you know, digital public goods. Um, I think one place where governments, I think regardless of where you are, really do have an opportunity is in the procurement um, and to kind of shape what they're buying and to shape the ecosystem. I have kind of maybe two quick things I'd say on this. So the first is, I think there's huge opportunities for you to, to kind of try to force, say, the platform players like Amazon and Microsoft to kind of move towards more open standards. And the, the Pentagon's procurement of, of, um, plot, of, um, of cloud and the JEDI procurement actually created provisions for this. It allowed for joint bids from say a Microsoft and Google coalition, which they were hoping was actually gonna force those players to get to shared standards so that you could be interoperable across cloud providers. And so I think governments need to be using their purchasing power to force those players to commoditize and standardize their offerings so we can move across them. And then maybe we don't care if they're open if we have a competitive marketplace where we can move around. Um, yeah, I think re moving to microservices uh, rather than saying your code is open, saying your microservices are clear and your APIs are replaceable is a huge, very positive step. Yeah, and, and so the, that that for me strikes me as one really great place, and then and then the other place is as, as we um, well, I'm actually, sorry, I'll stop there. Alistair, you go for it. Sure, you have some doubt. We're we're down to the last three minutes, and so yeah. I, I would ask everyone to give us three minutes, uh, one minute of wisdom. So give us your bumper sticker and give uh, I'll us give you a very one. short one, which is that I think if you've ever been to a local government meeting, you know that the edges of political opinion show up there. And unfortunately, the mainstream has checked out. You'd be a fool to go into politics today. Most of us in the in the moral middle have better things to do. And that tends to show up in government open source. You tend to have advocates and people who um, are not designing for broad adoption. Uh, but I think that we need to get the mainstream to check back in to uh, open source. And I think David proposes one way to do that, which is instead of being rigorous about code, being rigorous about uh, composable services and microservices and clear APIs. Until we get the average citizen to care about government uh, governance of code, accessibility, privacy, trust, portability, until these become mainstream things, we are going to continue to have this bad reputation is 
open source is open office. And if you can't figure that out, go by word. And that's a, yeah. that's been a problem for a long time. So uh, we need to make the open source alternatives uh, replaceable, portable, and desirable to the average person who cares about them, not the person who holds the podium for 10 minutes at the local town meeting. Great. Uh, so um, turn to Deb and to David with the concluding bumper sticker, but I'd also ask you, give us one resource that people could go to, to to delve deeper into these issues. We've posted a number of things on the chat and Alistair has already given us some great references. I will add to the chat the FWD 50 conference that he runs. He just did it virtually a month ago and it was a, an incredible conference. So <clears throat> the bumper sticker and a resource that people can use to delve into. And I hope everyone's looked at the chat. It's really rich in, in URLs and, and, and good questions. So Deb? All right, so I'm, I'm gonna commit to following up and providing some resources okay. that you can send to the attendees because at five o'clock in the morning, I'm just I'm just not clipping <laughs> along there. <laughs> but but uh, but but my my bumper sticker is I I guess my my completely thought is I, it's really important to understand that communities, open source communities are more important than the code themselves, and the people involved in the process and the journey is a tremendous part of the of value of open source. It's where great ideas happen and that's where good stuff is developed. So uh, whether you're highly technical or not, uh, I agree. We need to make sure people understand why open source is important and have them understand uh, that data sharing is not Facebook. Yeah, and Rotaro just pointed out, provided the uh, <clears throat> URL for OWASP, O W A S P. O-W-A-S-P. And, very uh, important, very important international organization. It's the gold standard for uh, secure, securing applications uh, on on the web. So, David? Yeah, to, to Deborah's point, I, mean, I, I gave a keynote at OSCON a number of years ago, and, and my, like, my kind of bumper sticker was, you know, your open source capital is your social capital. It's the, it's the organization, the community, and the people that make this valuable much more than the code, much more so than the code. The code is a is is always obsolete, and it's really it's the people that make it not obsolete. And so that that's where the investment is that that you really want to be focused on and that you want to be making. Um, I think I disagree with Alistair a little bit in that we need to make the public care. Um, I think it's actually the exact opposite that what we need to do is get to a place where the public is never going to care about these issues. What they're going to care about are good and and just outcomes. In the much the same way, like I don't care about the pipes, I don't care about the sewer. I want this type of problem to become a sewage problem where it's dealt with. I think it's done fairly. I think it's done equitably. I think it's done in a way that's efficient. And that's where we need to get to. And then we can move on to tackling things that are much higher on the stack. I think we have vehement agreement on that one. I think Alistair was saying we want people in there pushing for the solution. <clears throat> right and now we need, need to yell about the water in Flint, Michigan. When the taps pour clear, we can all forget about it. Exactly. Well, I want to thank everybody and I want to uh, join David in doing the happy, happy, you know, agree, agree symbol. I don't know if everybody else does that, but that is a sort of a, a thing here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the audience that has joined us. We've had a number of insights and lots of follow, follow up reading to do. Um, and we will continue this dialogue. We've got a lot of challenges ahead. So thank you. And if people want to stay on and ask questions in the chat, we're happy to answer them as best we can that way. But the formal part of this conversation is over. And I want to thank our three uh, conversation catalysts for getting up so early and being so alert and insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This was great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.